I'm Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute. Welcome to the NEI podcast. On this show, I sit down with renowned mental health care experts from a range of diverse backgrounds to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental health conditions. In this episode of the NEI podcast, we are discussing eating disorders, nutrition, and the brain. And I have here with me today, Dr. Cynthia Bulick. Dr. Bulick is a distinguished professor of eating disorders and founding director of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill Center of Excellence for Eating Disorders. Welcome, Dr. Bulick. Thanks so much, Sabrina. It's great to be here today. My first question for you is, how did you become interested in researching eating disorders? What led you to that? You know, it's interesting because I actually started studying childhood depression. And then I was asked to do a study by my mentor, and it was actually comparing depression and eating disorders. And I was like, yeah, I could do that, but I don't know anything about eating disorders. So Mm -hmm. I actually shadowed the psychiatrist who ran an eating disorders program in Pittsburgh. I was just amazed. And I was sort of amazed and shocked at the same time because I was a figure skater. I still am a figure skater. And this was back a long time ago. And I realized that so many people that I had skated with had had eating disorders, but they were either never treated or they just disappeared from the rink. And it's sort of like my sports world and my academic world collided right there. And I've been on Mm -hmm. that train ever since. Wow. Wow. What are some common misconceptions that you would say about eating disorders? What are some of those? I'm going to start out with the most important sentence that we're probably going to talk about in this whole podcast, and that is (laughs) that eating disorders don't discriminate. They don't Mm -hmm. care what sex or gender you are. They don't care what ethnicity or race you are. They don't care how much money you have. They don't care about any of those things, and they sure don't care about what body size you have. So Mm -hmm. eating disorders Mm -hmm. can really afflict people across all of those different spectra. Right, right. I think that's such an important point to make. Now, what would you say are the major eating disorders? I feel like there's not a lot of education on this and information out there. And, you know, there's a couple that, you know, I I could mention that it seems like people have heard of, but I, I feel like there's many that people don't really have a lot of awareness about. So what are those major eating disorders? Yep. So let's go in reverse, reverse order. So the, the ones that everybody hears about are usually the ones that people talk about most. So mm-hmm. the most common one is actually binge eating disorder. And a binge is defined like when someone eats an unusually large amount of food, but they feel out of control while they're doing it. It's that Mm -hmm. sense of out of control that really is the hallmark of a binge. And people with binge eating disorder don't have, you know, what we call compensatory behaviors like self-induced vomiting or laxative abuse to sort of undo the effect of the binge. And that's the most common eating disorder. And then we come down to bulimia nervosa, which I think most people have heard about. That's binge eating, but coupled with purging behaviors or excessive exercise or fasting. And I think the one that everybody thinks of is anorexia nervosa, because I Mm -hmm. think we read about that most. I think it scares people the most because you can see it. And then the one that you really don't hear a lot about and has only officially become an eating disorder is avoidant restrictive food intake disorder or ARFID. And that Mm. is, you know, that can happen in children, it can happen in adults, but it is extreme restrictive eating, but not due to weight and shape concerns. So people can be disinterested in food, there can be a lot of anxiety around food, they might have had a sort of an experience where they choked or they saw someone choke, and that sort of gave Mm -hmm. them a lot of fear. Mm And sometimes they're also just really uncomfortable with the textures or the colors of food, but it can be quite damaging to health. So none of these are benign. Wow. So this last one that you described, ARFID, I would say is one that most of the general public is not aware of. You know, it's not something that comes to mind when people think of eating disorders Can you describe a little bit more about how this disorder is different from the other ones? And I know you kind of touched on it, but could you tell us a little bit more about it? 
Sure. So the main difference is actually the reasons behind restricting food intake. You know, in okay. anorexia nervosa, it's usually about trying to lose weight, trying to reach some thin ideal. Although, frankly, I don't really believe that's the reason for it. It's just the cultural packaging we give it. But with ARFID, it is really more just sort of like this. It's either anxiety or mm-hmm. fear or just disgust by the texture or one of those conditioning experiences. And people with ARFID, well, they come in all shapes and sizes, so they don't necessarily Mm -hmm, have to mm -hmm. be thin, um, but they do have that aversion to eating. And and can this sometimes be coupled with, say, like a trauma or some emotional distress that the person is going through? Can can that ever happen? Sure, it can, and it doesn't have to be emotional. It can also be physical. You know, we've uh, okay. talked with some people who have had like severe illnesses or sort of traumatic medical experiences, and mm-hmm, those can mm-hmm. also trigger ARFID. And, you know, there's so much more to learn about this illness. Right, um, you know, right. We still don't have really good epidemiological studies where we look out there in the population and then dig deeply mm-hmm. about what the factors are that increase risk. Right, right. Wow. <laughs> it seems fascinating. How is intestinal microbiota involved when it comes to eating disorders? You know, that field is expanding too. The more we learn about microbiota and mental health, it's that is very, very exciting. And, you know, the more that we learn about it, it I think can be very helpful. What is its role in eating disorders and what do we know about that? Well, we started some of that research right here at UNC with Dr. Ian Carroll, who is a microbiologist, and he and I joined forces. And we did some early studies of anorexia nervosa that actually, you know, show and just using sort of common terminology, we talk about the microbiota as being, you know, the bugs in your gut, of which Mm -hmm. we have many. And one of the things that we found in people with anorexia was that they have a much lower diversity. So, their sort of like bug environment isn't as rich and diverse as a healthy person's is. Uh, Wow. And that in and of itself can sort of perpetuate anorexia. Mm -hmm. And so we've sort of been looking at, you know, are there ways that we could sort of like add targeted probiotics to treatment for anorexia nervosa to make the renourishment process sort of less uncomfortable and to make it easier and to make it more effective? But this research is really in its infancy. We have so much more to do to go from what we've observed to how we can use this information in treatment. What sorts of interventions are effective in treating anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder, the sort of the other major disorders that we've talked about? Are there effective interventions that can help? This is the sad part of the podcast because yeah. we'll start with anorexia nervosa and say that unfortunately we're not great at treating the illness and right, far too many right. people continue to die from anorexia nervosa and it just tears me apart every time I hear from another family member or partner that someone they loved has died. We know that the first step for treating anorexia is you have to re-nourish someone. Um, they mm-hmm, have to mm-hmm. gain weight. But right now, we don't have a single medication that works in the treatment of anorexia nervosa. Right. And that's depressing. Mm -hmm. For bulimia nervosa, Prozac or fluoxetine was, oh, it was approved by the FDA decades ago. And it's still the only FDA approved medication we have for bulimia, but it doesn't lead to long lasting sustained recovery. Mm -hmm. The treatment of choice for bulimia is actually a talk therapy. It's cognitive behavioral therapy or other types of therapy uh, that, you know, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy is where you really go in there and you sort of like examine the thoughts that lead you to these unhealthy behaviors and try to replace them with healthier, more health-promoting thoughts. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for binge eating disorder. We have one approved medication. It's Lizdexamphetamine or Vyvanse. And a lot of people don't really want to take it because it's an amphetamine and physicians don't necessarily want to prescribe it. And again, cognitive behavioral therapy works, but Mm. for only about 50% of the people. And relapse in both bulimia and binge eating disorder is high. So there's so much work to do in order to give clinicians a 
more full toolbox so that they have lots of options so that we can really personalize the treatment and not have this one size fits all approach to treating eating disorder. Right, right, right. What is your role like serving as senior faculty on the SAMHSA funded National Center of Excellence for Eating Disorders or NCEED? <gasps> Yes. So NC. Mouthful. <laughs> it is a mouthful. That's why we just say NC. We don't bother okay. like trying to spell it out because <laughs> you'll trip over your tongue. But Dr. Christine Pete, who was actually one of my postdocs years ago and then who became faculty at UNC, is the director of the only National Center of Excellence for Eating Disorders in the country. And wow. she has done a remarkable job developing this resource for primary care physicians, for other clinicians. It is the place to go for information about anything about eating disorders. You can get continuing education credits, you can do trainings, and you can get a screening. We They developed something called an ESPER, which is a screening that you can use in a primary care office. Like if a doctor is concerned that someone has an eating disorder, they can whip this out, screen the person on the spot, and then say, okay, you know, this person is at risk or has an eating disorder, we need to get them referred to specialist care. And my role on NSEED is, you know, I've been in the field for a long time. I'm long in the tooth, as they say. So I just <laughs> sort of like advise and, you know, give them perspective. And I have a lot of institutional memory about where the field has been over time. Mm-hmm. And then my other role is we actually developed, I developed a treatment with my colleagues, Dr. Don Bauckham and Jennifer Kirby, of treating couples when someone has an eating disorder. And this isn't just bringing the partner in one or two times. It's the partner comes in for every single session. And it works and and it's powerful. That's amazing. It is so cool because we do that with children. You know, the other thing we didn't talk about before is for the other anorexia, Uh family-based treatment works for youths who have anorexia nervosa. And that's when the whole family is involved. Right. And I was like, right. you know, for grownups, they're on their own. And then mm-hmm. we were like, let's bring the partner in. Mm-hmm. So we're at in finishing stages now of developing a web-based program so more clinicians around the world can learn how to do Unite, which is uniting couples in the treatment of eating disorder. Wow, that is so inspirational. I'm really, really glad you shared that with us. So there is hope. <laughs> And and that's wonderful that you've been such a part of that development. Can you tell us more about the Eating Disorders Working Group of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, or PGCED? Sure. So another another organization with lots of letters. Yes. Um, the the PGC or the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium is the largest collaboration in the history of psychiatry. Wow. So it brings together over 800 clinicians and researchers and geneticists to study genetic factors that influence all of the psychiatric disorders. Wow. So depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, autism. That's amazing. And in 2013, I founded the Eating Disorders Working Group of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, which is now up to over 200 clinicians and researchers. Oh my gosh. Um, from I think 20 countries, maybe 22 countries now around the world who specifically study and identify the genes and gene pathways as well as environmental factors that influence risk for anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, and ARFID. Wow. That is so exciting. What has that experience been like in building that? It's been, it's been amazing. And, you know, as you have to go where the funding comes Mm -hmm. and we were funded to do the first big genetic study on anorexia nervosa. We're doing bulimia and binge eating disorder and ARFID now as well. But the anorexia study actually changed the way we understand the biology of anorexia because up until now, um, it's really been considered a psychiatric illness. Mm-hmm. And in fact, there's been a lot of talk about it being more of a sociocultural illness, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, which I disagree with. There are so sociocultural forces involved, but it's, they don't cause it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But what we found in our first study of almost 17,000 people with anorexia nervosa and a large number of people without anorexia nervosa, because you compare their genomes to figure out where they're different. Right. We found that 
well, not first we found out um, we identified regions where genes that influence anorexia lie. But then we found out that those genes are not just genes that influence psychiatric factors, but they also influence metabolic factors. Wow. And in fact, there were some really strong associations between the genetic factors that influence anorexia and those that influence metabolism and body weight and shape. And so we actually said we need to start thinking about anorexia as a metabopsychiatric illness, oh my goodness. not only as a psychiatric illness. And that's that's a big change. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. Wow. Well, that is fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, sure. And with that being said, what preliminary findings can you share with us from the ARFID Gen study? Yep. So Arphagen just launched. So we've sort of only been up and running for a little over a month or two, I think. But what I can share is what sort of justified doing that study. Um, because before you embark on a big genetic study of anything, you need to make sure that the disorder or the trait that you're looking at is actually heritable. Mm -hmm. You know, the genes play a role. And one of my postdocs in Sweden, because I also have a team at Karolinska Institute in Sweden, um, did a twin study where she showed that the heritability of ARFID is 79%. Oh, wow. And what that means is that 79% of liability to developing ARFID is due to genetic factors. Now, 100% would mean that it's all genetic. So clearly, there's still about a quarter of the risk that's associated with the environment. But that's really high. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's one of the highest percentages of all psychiatric illnesses. So we were able to take that finding to the National Institute of Mental Health and say, hey, um, ARFID really is genetically influenced. Um, you know, and we submitted a grant and we said, could you please give us funding to do a large genetic study of ARFID? And they did. So, you know, that's the kind of formative information that you need in order to launch a big study like this. Wow. Well, that takes me to our final question, which is, do you have any advice for clinicians who are managing and treating patients with eating disorders? What can you share? I do. I have a couple pieces of advice. Um, one is really to stick with your patients. Um, they're going to recovery from eating disorders from all of the eating disorders is not linear. Mm -hmm. And sometimes parents and partners and even clinicians expect recovery just to go in a you know, straight line up the hill, getting better and better and better. Mm -hmm. But it's actually much more of a curvy, messy, wiggly line where people take, you know, a couple steps forward and they might take another step backward. But, you know, we've heard from so many people with eating disorders that the most important thing in their recovery is relationships. Yeah. And that can be a parent, it can be a friend, it can be a partner, it can be your therapist. And it's just believing in them and giving them hope and you know, talking to them firmly, but with compassion about how you're concerned about them. You know, it's hard work to get better, but you're going to be there with them while they go through that process. And I think that kind of that stance is one that I think can really help people get through these really challenging illnesses to recover from. But there is hope. You can get better and people do get better. And I think Keeping people, keeping that hope front and center, even when things feel dark, is a really important thing that you can do to support someone with an illness. I love that. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this fascinating information with us. And thank you for being on our show. Thank you so much for talking about this important topic and for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the NEI podcast. Please let us know what you'd like to hear more about by leaving a review. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today. 